Hi, this is the Social Jello with Angelo show. My name's Angelo. I'm a social scientist, surfer, martial artist, and a whole lot of other things. Coming to you live from Kasai City, Japan, the Social Jello with Angelo show. What's up, and welcome to another episode of the Social Jello with Angelo podcast. The streets versus combat sports, or MMA, as you saw in the title. This is a conversation I had with UFC coach John Hackleman and MMA coach Ramsey Dewey. Ramsey Dewey runs a YouTube channel. Uh, you can see right here, Ramsey Dewey channel. And John Hackleman runs another YouTube channel called the Pit Online Dojo. And we do a show once a week called the Live Clean and Fight Dirty Show. So we got together and I facilitated a conversation with these two guys because Ramsey Dewey is always talking about this concept, this concept that he calls power fantasy that the self-defense industry is trying to scare the shit out of people to do self-defense when in reality you don't actually encounter that many street encounters you should be practicing because you feel like getting better at a martial art for the sake of getting better well john hackleman has more of a street mentality as far as street self-defense and that's and he's also an mma coach that's the really interesting part about this conversation they are both mma coaches um as if you don't know who John Hackleman is, he is uh, Chuck Liddell's Chuck Liddell's coach. If you don't know who Chuck Liddell is, I don't know what rock you live under, but hey, Google it. He is a UFC champion, and he's produced several UFC champions um, at this point in his martial arts career. So it is interesting to see this conversation between two MMA coaches. So the problem that they they're not having a problem with combat sports. They both love MMA, but John Hackleman has a particular view that. Self-defense is very important, and he goes into the details on that. And Ramsey is just trying to figure out what his process is, because Ramsey has a different approach, and he explains that. So, without further ado, the streets versus MMA. Well, I don't know if it's really MMA, but it's an interesting conversation. Let's check it out. Some other techniques, which oh, sorry, which you can't use, which you cannot use in the street. I mean, you can't use it in the cage, but you can in the street. And then there's some mm-hmm. techniques that in jujitsu, you know, it's, it's a sport, so I, I don't advocate them for the streets. So there's like five or six techniques, but almost all of them you can use in both. So sure. with those two things, um, I don't know. Did I cover both? Because then then I think I think that's – is that what you're saying that – like, or do you think – People will never get attacked because I, I, I'm I'm all for never getting attacked. But <laughs> in school, you're going to get attacked, and if for if anything else by a bully, you're, everybody knows they'll be. But I was bullied, so I know for a fact people Same. get bullied. So that there Same. goes our kids one, and not getting bullied is the key to your confidence, and that's the key to growing up and being a better adult because you have confidence. Now, as an adult, your chances of getting jumped are very slim, depending on where you're living. And a lot of times it will involve a firearm. And you had a bad, uh, a bad experience with a, with a, with a, you know, with a firearm, blah, blah, blah. I, I, I see that kind of, kind of stuff. But the last one I went to was put on by Tim Kennedy. And um, it was, you know, it was, it was a protector course. And I went to that. It was a three-day course, and there was none of that shenanigans. But it was also every one of his instructors and him had been in a lot of these kind of fights mm-hmm. and a lot of these kind of fights. So I took their, I took their, um, I took their course, you know, very seriously. I'm not a gun expert. I don't pretend to be, but I do. I do think I, I'm a common sense ex- expert. Like I would know in common sense that this tech, this stance right here will get you hurt in a real fight, right? Um, mm-hmm. But I'm not a kata expert either. So I don't know, right. is that, is it, are we on the same page or what? I, I, I think so. So your, your first point I think was a phenomenal point that everybody needs to pay attention to. If we essentially take alcohol out of the equation, street fights get reduced a lot so i've ended up in a lot of online arguments about about street fights because i've made the point if you've been in more than a couple of street fights in your life you are probably the jerk starting them and 
I think most reasonable people can think, yeah, that sounds reasonable. However, I've had a lot of people push back on that. No, no, I have to get into a lot of street fights constantly because I basically live in, in a place where, and I'm like, well, where do you live? And it's some, some nice neighborhood in, in rural America. And it's like, what, what led you to that situation? And almost always it's alcohol. Well, I was at the bar and I was drinking and push came to shove. So again, most of these, most of these altercations are avoidable. I would say the overwhelming majority of what is peddled as self-defense is not self-defense. It is, it's, it's aggression gone too far. Now you, you, brought up two points bullying for children and this is something i went through a lot i was beaten up a lot as a kid i i ended up um the target of a number of bullies at my school but we, before you go on this before is you go why on. i got into but, martial arts yeah but before you go on. and this that's a big one and we agree on it mm. and i was bullied too i grew up in honolulu hawaii where they hate whites and i was i was in a lot of bullying situations so in that situation, we can get to the adult one later, but that in that situation, that's schoolyard. We call those schoolyard uh, uh, fights, and I was probably in way too many of them. And I wasn't, I, I don't think I was the jerk. Like if somebody came up to me and said, hey, fucking Howley, go back to the mainland and shove me. I don't think I started that. And, but mm -hmm. but so we, we separate schoolyard bullying from street situations. So right. schoolyard bullying is more about whacking the kid, and then all of a sudden nobody picks on you anymore. Now you got confidence. Now that so okay, so I mm. see that, and the adult one's a whole different picture. But as a, as right. a bully, bullying, you don't have to be the 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 jerk because bullies might bullies in high school or school they pick on people that just look weak and, 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 and cowardly and they attack and they attack them. So what we want to do is teach our kids not to be weak and cowardly. And that's one way, whether for whatever reason you get picked on, whether it's any demographic you have or color or anything, if you get put, you're never going to get picked on if you have confidence. If you are that guy that exudes confidence from martial arts, I, I'm going to say from martial arts, but a lot of you get it a lot of other ways too. Mm -hmm. You're not going to get bullied. I don't care if you're black, white, Chinese, uh, whatever, whatever orientation you have. If you present yourself with confidence, boom, your bullying is has stopped right there. Mm -hmm. And then There's just so to, much truth to that. Yes, just to pick up where you left off, Ramsey, you were talking about being bullied and, and your experiences with that. Yeah, yeah. Sorry about that. Yeah, sure. So that that is that is the reason I got into martial arts in the first place because I was bullied, and I saw a Bruce Lee movie where this fairly unimposing guy with muscles, though, effortlessly beats up groups, entire groups of attackers, and I thought, okay, that's the answer to my problems. If I can fight like that, all my problems will go away. Now, in my childhood, my violence was the answer. And as oh, over the decades, obviously, that answer has, has changed quite a bit. Now, I have been assaulted on the streets a number of times. Going back to the term power fantasy, I've been mugged at gunpoint six times when I lived in Latin America. Um, and... Uh, how many gun disarm videos have you seen on YouTube or seen taught in any sort of self-defense scenario? I've, I've seen it a lot. And I would say almost all of those are pure power fantasy. Here's what happened when I was mugged at gunpoint. There's a man standing about 10, 12 feet away, and he's holding a firearm, pointing it at me, says, give me a peso or I'll give you a shot in the head. Give me all your money. Drop everything you have. Even if I was an expert at disarming a gun, how the heck am I going to reach a gun from 10 or 12 feet away? That is power fantasy. The, the idea that somebody's going to hold one right at your head, 
And, and even then, that's that's <laughs> even if that does happen to you, the likelihood of getting shot while you're doing your kung fu disarm is is exponentially high. All it takes is pressure on that trigger, and one misstep, and and it's it's death. I do have a friend who got shot in the head in a similar scenario to that. So again, that's anecdotal, but I think that anecdote is still indicative of what probably would happen in that specific scenario. But again, every single time I was robbed at gunpoint, there was a, a considerable distance between me and the attacker. They understand what a ranged weapon is. They're not an idiot. They know I've got a, uh, an extreme advantage at this distance. So when I say power fantasy, it's it's the idea of we are going to we are going to practice this gun disarm at close range to make us feel good about ourselves to make us feel more powerful and maybe that might give somebody confidence we're not talking about a, a, a child being bullied at school but an adult an adult man entertaining this idea of one a scenario which is very unlikely and two, a scenario which would result in his own death, but it is being sold as, as the truth. I think that is dishonest, it is just dis, disgenuine, and it is dangerous. So, again, that's, that's just one example of what I mean when I say self-defense is power fantasy. Now, people take issue with that because that's not all of what self-defense entails self-defense is a legal term it's a legal term to justify violent action that would otherwise be illegal in order to protect yourself to protect others or to protect your property depending on which country or jurisdiction you live in and that the the reality of self-defense as as i just defined it is is so often conflated with simply my feelings are hurt or I am angry and therefore I'm justified in using violence however I see fit in order to indulge this fantasy that I have about it. That's where I'm coming from. Does that make sense? Hmm. Okay. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, I, I think I think we're on the same page. Um, confidence, confidence is very important. I'm, I'm talking mainly about about kids and and uh, and um, and you know schoolyard stuff, and that's a whole program I have. And then with my adults, um, we don't do we don't do uh, ours is an unarmed system, so we do. You know, you get shoved, you get touched, you get pushed. Mm. You know, somebody somebody uh, hey, so, um, for whatever reason you 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 you're. We're learning. We're teaching the, the adults how to be confident in in you know in a just an old fashioned. If somebody shoves mm -hmm. them, somebody they're in a at a party and somebody grabs their wife. Something where that kind of stuff. Somebody somebody comes up to attack them. We don't even talk about weapons. Then our weapon stuff is some knives. If you have a gun too, or if you have a knife too. Um, which you should always carry. And we're in, in this country. Um, I, I'm really, really heavy on on being weaponized because they are out there. You have to assume they are. But the gun stuff, I agree with you 100%. I think of the gun stuff, like all that stuff. I've had I've had guns pulled on me more than once. Um, I got a uh, and and the one the one I remember the most was. Just exactly like you said, and but I was in I was in a weird place in my life right then. Just had my second kid. I had no money. I was in a really bad situation money wise, mm -hmm. and I had two kids, and I was going to school to try to you know get this good good job, and and I, I was down on my luck. And this guy came up to me. I was talking to my buddy outside of school, and he came up to me with a gun, and I was like, I put my hands up, and he was too far. He was far. I couldn't touch him. But the problem is, I didn't. I've never learned gun disarms, but I just thought if I got to him close enough, I could. I could take the gun away. I probably couldn't have, and I'm glad I did. Mm -hmm. I wasn't able to. But I took a couple steps towards him. I had 200 bucks in my pocket, 
because I just came to the, from the uh, the ATM and that was all I had. And I was like, if this if he gets my money, I can't. I don't know what to do. So I was like, bro, I don't have any money. Come search me. And I was trying to get him close enough to get the gun away. I would have got shot, mm. but I I thought that. And he he ended up running, getting in a car, driving away, and I just thought. Holy shit, what the fuck? I'm stupid as hell. But mm. my confidence that I'm teaching my guys is just to be a stronger, fitter adult who can take care of themselves if they have to. A lot of times weapons come into play and we do some knife work, very, very little. More, you have one too. Uh, we don't do the gun stuff, but I do encourage my guys to to, to go to classes to learn that. But um, right. But, um, but that, I mean, that's, so that's my idea of confidence for a guy. Be, if you're a man, be a fucking man, be an alpha male and, and be able to handle yourself and don't think you can do the takeaway of the, the gun and the, all that, but know that you can mm. handle yourself. To me, that's what an adult male nowadays wants to be. He wants to, we want to transfer him from a beta to an alpha. When I say alpha, I don't mean walk around with a UFC shirt saying, oh, I'm a, or not UFC shirt. Oh God, I have a UFC shirt. <laughs> Where are Says you? the guy with the UFC shirt. shirt. Right. Yeah, a tap out <laughs> shirt. You know, remember, remember the old tap out guys, you know, yeah, yeah, I love yeah. them, but they had a lot of guys that wear tap out shirts and then they would act up and they're not. So I don't there want my guys to do that, it, yeah. but I want them to be confident where they can just throw handle themselves with their fists. I don't get into the gun stuff not even that much with the knife stuff, but I want to give my guys the, cur the the confidence that they can throw again. Back when they were kids, you know, they're now they're adults. I want I want them to have that confidence. They will be better prepared for a street attack if they ever get attacked. Hopefully, they don't. But you know, and we don't cover them weapons if they want to. You know, I think everybody should carry a CCW if they're you know not a felon or a knife at least, so they're able to protect themselves that way. But I don't I don't get that much into the, the gun stuff. So my my idea of my self-defense is I want my my guys to be confident. I want them to just know they're stronger, they're fitter, they're gonna last longer in bed, they're gonna look better, they're gonna perform better, they're gonna be more productive at work. They're just mm -hmm. better humans. They're and they're gonna be harder to kill. There's no way around it. If you're fitter, you know how to throw, punch, kick, elbow. Take down, double leg, body slam, someone onto the concrete. If you know those things, you are going to be a more of a confident person. But I don't want them to be overly confident where it's a false sense of security. They think if they, mm. they can take a knife or a gun away. If somebody, the first thing I'll, ask, I'll tell my guy, if somebody pulls a knife on you in the, in the street, boom, pull out your gun. You want to go home. Forget the law at that second. That second, the law doesn't matter because if, if you think about the law and you go, I can't pull out my gun, he only has a gun, oh, and you get stabbed, guess what? You're not going home ever again. I'd rather you go mm. home and, and go to court and maybe even go to jail than go to the morgue or a nursing home and spend the rest of your life. So I try to give my guys the confidence of, of being tough guys where they don't have to be a tough guy, but they're tough humans. I want them to be tough humans, stronger, fitter, more dynamic human beings. So that's that's my sure. idea of giving confidence to adults. Confidence to kids is they can handle themselves in the schoolyard and nobody's going to take their lunch money. Bang. Now I got those two and I, I feel like I'm a success as a martial arts instructor. Yeah, sure. I think I think that's uh, that's the ideal of every martial arts instructor. We want to give that feeling to our students without, of course, as as you gave in that caveat, um, hyper inflating their ego or, or giving them some sort of false security. Right yeah. now, here here's a question for you. Um, and uh, I, I guess I'm going to clarify this question a little bit with. Uh, with this. So I, I talk a lot about fear mongering on my channel when the subject of self-defense comes up. And th this, is, this is a big problem that I see with the self-defense industry is where we get outside of the, the realm of trying to give people genuine confidence in genuine abilities. And 
get into it's almost like a cult mentality you know a lot of a lot of i would say bad self defense instructors or bad self defense schools become cults and anybody can do it anybody can fall into into this realm of of culthood where where the the leader the um the martial arts, arts instructor becomes god and you owe your allegiance to them they become like a surrogate family of sorts but not in a good way and it comes from fear mongering selling the idea of fear you need me and without me you are helpless without what i have to offer you are in mortal danger constantly now it 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 doesn't sound like you're one of these guys i've i've, I've followed your work for some time and as far as I can tell, you're definitely not one of these guys, but uh, I've seen a lot of them out there professing to be self-defense instructors. And this, this, this worries me. I see it, I see it a lot when, when people push back against what I have to say about the self-defense industry, and it's always with a fear-mongering power fantasy, and it usually goes something like this. Well, what if you're walking down the street, always the street, not, not the sidewalk, and... Um, a bunch of guys jump out and rape your wife and daughter. What are you going to do? But it's always that situation. And obviously this, this is a situation that could potentially happen. However, that is an example of fear mongering, selling the idea. You need this class. You need this course. You need this instructor. You need the school specifically because if you don't, this horrible thing will happen to you. Okay, so I see a lot of self-defense marketed that way. So, John, how do you personally market your services? I think I think um, I think I anti-market first because I don't mm. want people thinking that I'm, you know, I mean, in the beginning everything was about the MMA. I had all these fighters and they're tough and they're this and they fight in a cage mm. and yada yada. And I got more. I got more people scared of my gym than flocking to my gym. Like even hmm. when, are you going now? Okay, I love you. Okay, thanks. All right, we will. All right, love you, Valley. Thanks for coming with me today. Don't give me a quick kiss. I'll be right there. Hey, I love you. That is really you interesting. I love you guys. I'll see you tomorrow. My grandson and my daughter. Yep. Um, okay, yeah. Yeah, so, what you said um, right there was super interesting. I'd like to hear more. The, um, so, Everybody thought, oh, you must, your gym's going to be packed. You're going to, you have this, and you have Chuck, and da, da, da. I go, more people didn't come than came because mm. everybody that drove by my little town, we have a cute little town. They didn't grow up like I grew up, where I grew up. I grew up in Honolulu, Hawaii, where they do not like white people. And there's a lot, Hawaii is a very rough place. They like to fight mm. in Hawaii. And, and, and um, they don't in Arroyo Grande, California, where I live now. Beautiful place, but it's not rough. Like most of the kids, have never been in a schoolyard fight their whole, you know, then when as an adult, they've never been in a fight. Um, so I love that. I, I'm jealous of that. And I'm not, you know, but I still have to, I want, I want the kids. They still get bullied though. They still get bullied and adults don't very much, but they still, this is very interesting. Uh, I had, I had a really smart guy. He's a doctor. And, and, and he's so smart and he's, you know, I, I was talking to him one day and, and he was like, man, I love the confidence I get here. I go, like, well, I mean, you're a doctor, you're so smart. He goes, I know, but no matter how smart I am, whenever I walk in into a party or a room with my wife and, or, you know, a bar or a restaurant, if I look, I look, I look, my, I look down, if somebody gives me a look, when the big guy comes in or some, you know, macho looking guy, comes in, I look down, I, I'm nervous. I, I don't know what to do. I, I, want, I need that confidence, you know? And since I've been mm. training, you know, I, I feel like I can look at people in the eye now and I feel that physical confidence. I always had confidence I could, I could you know, I could support my wife and my kids, but I always, I always feared, you know, physical confrontations. And I, he said, I don't anymore. And, and that's one thing I got from martial arts, you know? and. Um, that's very important to me. That's what I consider um, going from a beta to an alpha. I think a beta, like I said, alpha, I don't think of alpha as, uh, I think of an alpha as being secure. I think of him being confident, making eye contact. Hey, what's up, bro? How you been? Don't even know the guy. 
My my grand, I was hanging out with my grandson today, and he goes, Grandpa, you don't even know these people, do you? I go, no. He goes, you talk to everyone. I go, yeah, I just do. I, I see everybody I talk to. I want to give them eye contact, and I want to nod. And if they want to try to mad dog me, which some people do once in a while, I have the confidence to smile at them and walk right by. That means a lot for a man. You know, just, just the simple eye contact, just the simple walking into a situation with your loved ones, knowing I got this, guys. Let's go. And it's not, oh, I'm going to jump the guy in the street. I'm going to get wife jumped and kids jump. I don't think of all that. I just think of that, make, giving that adult a confidence that will he'll carry through him and make him a happier, more peaceful person. And if he ever does get jumped, he will be a better fighter. I guarantee you that. Now, if a guy pulls a gun on him, you know, we don't train for that. And, and you know, that's, that's just not in our wheelhouse. A roadhouse. Is mm. it wheelhouse? Wheelhouse, right? It's, it's wheelhouse. Roadhouse is, is the <laughs> right. Okay. So it's not <laughs> that's not in our wheelhouse, but I'll tell you what, I give them the confidence to carry themselves where they're not gonna get attacked as as much as they would have if they look like a, a beta. An alpha's not gonna get attacked as much. And then when the kids, I just want the kids to have the fun time in school and not worry about getting his lunch money taken. I want them to go in the schoolyard and just, I, they don't have to protect all the other kids. That's one thing a lot of martial arts schools teach is like, yeah, you learn this. And if you see little Johnny or your buddies getting picked on, you go, you go be their protector too. No, protect yourself. And if you see somebody getting bullied, maybe you could say something, then go tell, tell the teacher. But I don't want them jumping in, protecting the world because sometimes you might be wrong if you don't know the whole story, the backstory. Same thing on the street. I don't want you to be the protector of everyone because you don't know. There could be on the guy on the ground getting stomped by somebody and you think you know, so you go in and protect them, you get stabbed and you found out the guy that's on the ground being stomped just raped the guy's kid. So we don't know the backstories. So I just want you to be able to protect yourself, protect your family, protect your community. If you're an adult, if you're a kid, I want you to have the confidence to go in the schoolyard and have fun and not worry about getting your lunch money taken. So I think mm -hmm. I think that's kind of a, that's my thing. And like I said, the gun stuff and, and all those crazy situations, I don't really go there much because that's not my wheelhouse. You know, if somebody attacks right. me, whether they have a knife or not, I want to I want to think that I'm better prepared than I would have been if I didn't train. But if I spent all my time on knives, I wouldn't have as much time as my hands. If I spent all my time with guns, I wouldn't have as much time with my hands. I specialize on unarmed self-defense. Boom. Man, cool. I sound like I was making a speech, huh? <laughs> it did sound speech. like a speech. Nobody's even here right now. <laughs> Nobody's listening. I can't get an ovation here. Very convincing. Anyway. Very convincing. <laughs> so, but that's I, true. I, I, I mean, that's that's what I do. That's what I do. I love what I do. I'm proud of what I do. I, I feel so good when I the, the 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 sheriff of our county, you know, is is one of my black belts, and I'm so proud of this guy. And we have cops, and we have deputies, and mm -hmm. we have I have a doctor that trained with me. I was, you know, he wasn't. He was kind of a timid guy, but he was he was uh, he was an orthopedic. He's an orthopedic surgeon and. You know, he wanted to train. My daughter, my son was going out with his daughter and he came by my gym a couple of times. He, ah, I don't know if I can do that. You know, I make, I make all my money with these hands and he came and watched. And next thing I know, like months later, one day he just said, man, I've been watching your class. I want to try it, man. Can, how can I protect my hands? So I taught him. I've never had a broken hand in any of my fighters when I wrapped their hands. So I wrapped up his hands and I said, bro, go to it. Next thing I know, seven years later, he's getting his black belt. We're, we're still best friends. And his, his whole demeanor, when he spars now, instead of like this, he's like, you know, he's, he's confident now. When I see him walking with his wife now, it's a different person. And I'm so hmm. proud of that because that's what we do. We do that as realistic martial arts instructors. If the guy pulled a gun, He's not going to go, oh, he's not. He's going to have the confidence probably to say, hey, I'll see you later and run, you know. But if mm. somebody came up to him 
and looked at him right in the eyes, I know right now he has the confidence to look at him and nod and say, what's up, bro, and walk away. And that means a lot to me that I changed these people. We changed these people's lives for the better. And guess, hmm. and guess what? He's, he's performing. Yeah, I bet you all these guys, I'm not going to say him because it's so awkward. I know his wife. <laughs> but all, the, all, all, all of our guys, they're not only pro more productive human be beings, harder to kill, better parents, they're also better in the sack. <laughs> Bing. Anyway, whatever. That was a bit much. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, it's, it's not too much. Confidence is, it, it can't be overstated. And I, I love the fact that that is how you market your services because. You know, even even in the the hypothetical oh, but, well, scenario. Before you finish, let me just say yeah. one thing. The other thing with that self, I got away from the MMA. I downplay the MMA so much, and I have for years because they have taken away so many of my students because they drive by and go, "Oh, shit, let's go fast," because I don't want to get like they have cages in there. They have cage fighters, but when people do finally come in, like they, you know, they they their buddies have been coming. They they try a class. I probably had a hundred people lately. When I say lately, in the last couple of years, say, "Man, this is like a family gym." I thought we man, we've been thinking all along. There's just a bunch of blood on the floor and people beating <laughs> each other. But you have kids. You have costume parties and Halloween. We have Christmas parties. We have you know Easter egg hunts. We have three year old kids. We have seventy three year old guys with their with their martial arts uh, geese on and stuff. So it's not, it's a family gym. And on right. the side, on the side, my hobby, I train fighters. But that's not my side. That, is, that has nothing to do with our gym. It involves the culture because guys like Glover and Chuck, they're such sweet guys. And when they interact with my, with my students, my students fall in love with them. You know, so that's mm. a great thing to say, hey, the guy's going to fight. So when they become part of my students, and then they realize, hey, he has a fight team too. His guy's fighting this week. Let's check him out on TV. They get that pride. So that helps now. It helps build up pride and kind of like a sense of like, you know, hey, they, my guys have a, we have a fight team at our gym. Now they look at it like, you know, they don't want to be cage fighters, but they can, you know, watch a fight, watch the UFC. Hey, that's one of our guys, you know. So it, it builds up to it now. But we still downplay and say, hey, just because you're, you know, you're not going to learn how to be a bully, you know, you're going to learn how to, you know, defend against mm. bullies. Anyway, sorry to interrupt. Yeah, th this is actually a topic that it's super interesting to me, especially as, a, as an MMA coach. I've been working in, in the mixed martial arts industry and in, in mixed martial arts gyms, running gyms, et cetera, for a very long time. And... Uh, yeah, but it's a problem. It can be a major problem, especially yeah. like like here in China, where I essentially had to pioneer the sport of mixed martial arts in Shanghai, where nobody knew what it was. And you try to sell this idea of cage fighting to a population who doesn't know what a cage fight is. And they they stare at you like you're an alien. This is how it was 16 years ago. They stare at you like you're an alien when you try to explain the concept, like, why would I want to do that? That's insane. But yeah, I, I, I would love to have a whole conversation about just that, that topic alone, but, but we're here to talk about self-defense. I assume that's, that's what Angelo told me. So I, I do have a question, another question for you, since you, you, you made an excellent, uh, essentially uh, excellent defense of your position. Let's, let's bring this, Bring in the, the Hegelian dialectic and give points and counterpoints here. So here's here's my counterpoint question for you. Uh, what, what would you say are some of the major problems with the self-defense industry that you have seen personally? Uh, the, uh, the, 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 the Bullshito, the dojo, McDojo. Right, right. Uh, my biggest one in the unarmed world is, um, is uh, katas and forms. Things mm. that are choreographed. Um, I love to watch them, but I love to watch Pop Lock and too. But neither one, I think, belongs in in mm. any kind of martial arts realm. I think it takes away from from it, and it gives people a false sense of security. Um, mm. And I think the time that you have with your students, you owe them. You know, you owe unless they came for kata, and you do that as an upsell, and they want to be like whatever, um, right. then that's great. And a lot of schools I know do that as an upsell, just like 
weaponry, et cetera. When I say weaponry, I mean the, the traditional martial arts weapons, which you can't use in the street or don't use. Um, but, but I think, I think if you, if you, if you, if you're take if you're taking any time, any time you got the average person, I don't know how it is there here. The average person is two hours a week at your gym, two hours right. a week. You know, unless they're really hardcore, they do extra class and stuff. But the average student spends two hours a week, his mm. hour and a half a week. So if you don't spend every freaking second of that teaching them how to be in better shape, to be stronger, learn how to defend against things that really happen, like a, like a tackle, which we call a double leg, but it's really a tackle, or a punch in the face, and learn how to defend that. So they don't hit you anymore. You win the fight. You get to go home to your family. You win the fight in the schoolyard. You get to be, you know, more of a confident person. Anything you take away from that is is it's a crime. You're you're you, it's a disservice to your students because you're fooling them into thinking all, all any of that stuff is going to work in the street. And when guys get called on it, they say, "Well, bunkai." You know, if you study the bunkai, then this technique will really mean he's touching you this way. You put your hand here, you do this, then you do this. That's what that means. But you don't have to, it's, it's, it's all a complicated foolery. It's like tomfoolery. Mm -hmm. And it, there's, there's the a thing lot of that bothers bunkai, me about it the most, the, the most thing that bothers me about it is, first of all, I had to learn katas coming up, even kata mm -hmm. The, supposedly one of the most hardcore martial arts in the world, um, they had katas. And I used to tell my instructor, at freaking 10 years old, I would say, hey, Chief, I don't really know what that's going to do for me if I get in a fight. Why do I have to practice it? And my instructor, who was an in and out of prison, kind of really, really, he was one of my mentors in toughness, but not in, in, in how to be a good person. But anyway, he's dead now. Um, but he used to tell me, John, shut the fuck up, go practice your kata, and when you get your black belt, you don't have to do them anymore. Right now, you have to do them. So I would do them, but we didn't do that many katas. But anyway, so I just feel like as, as, a, as an instructor, we owe it to our students to teach them to be better people, you know, in the street and, and you know, in the family and, you know, in the gym and, you know, in life. I want to create a champion in life before I care about a champion in the cage or in the ring. And you're not mm. teaching them anything, anything good by teaching them that. And you're not only teaching them bad stuff, you, every, every minute you spend on a choreographed bullshit move, you take away from the good stuff you should be teaching them. They're not gonna be as good as shape. They're not gonna be a good a fighter. They're not gonna defend the takedowns as well. They're not gonna defend the punches as well. You are doing them, you're doing them a disservice. And I think it's a crime. It's a crime to do that. You're stealing their money. That's what I feel about that. And yeah, you know what Marshall- I 100% Marshall does? agree with that. You know what MMA does, which, you know, uh, it, it 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 helps the bunkai. MMA is my bunkai. So like mm. I'm teaching a specific hook and then they watch it on TV and they go, oh shit, that's the hook we're work. That's the one that's, hey, that one works. You know, that's how it works. Okay. So they get to learn all these techniques and, and they watch them. It's like a testing ground, right? It's like, mm. a, it's like, it's like put them in a, t a testing ground. You're like, how's this technique going to work? Boom, let's see. Boom. You know, I would teach Chuck a certain technique for a certain fight. We'd work on a certain thing. And some of my students would see it because they, they would come to the gym and stuff. And then they'd watch this fight and they'd go, holy shit, that really worked. And was, there's nothing choreographed <laughs> about that when he's fighting guys trying to take his head off. So that's that. Yeah, man. That's, I, I love that answer. I love that answer. I caught a forms, taolu, pumse, whatever you want to call your forms, it's it's always frustrated me uh, since since I started, I, and I've I practiced a lot of traditional martial arts. I've got black belts in Taekwondo, Shotokan, Kyokushin, and 
and I practiced various uh, Chinese traditional martial arts, um, Tai Chi, Bagua, and so on. And they all have forms. And the overwhelming majority of martial arts teachers who teach traditional martial arts with forms will never teach any application of the form. And if they do, as you said, it's usually some nonsense. And it, it's something that will never come into play in a fight. Now, I've learned probably the most about applications of forms by wrestling, just laying hands on a guy on the wrestling mat and wrestling with them and realizing, well, hold on a second, this cr crazy story. So I'm, I was uh, just wrestling, sparring with one of my, one of my wrestling coaches at one of my old gyms. And I, I tie up with him. I've got wrist control. I got a collar tie. And then he does exactly the karate low block on me, pulling one arm back and stripping the grip. And I grab his wrist again, and he does it again. I grab the wrist again, he does it again. You know, we've got this pressure, counter pressure, and he's striking right against the grip. And I'm like, holy crap, that's karate. And he's like, that's wrestling. And this, this changed my whole paradigm about forms. And looking at, at, at all that stuff in forms that doesn't look like punching and kicking and doesn't look like it would successfully block a punch, I realized, well, most of that stuff isn't punching or kicking or blocking punches. So much of that stuff is grappling. If you look at it through the, the lens of grappling, a lot of it starts to make sense. But even then, even then, teaching, teaching forms that way, like we have to spend hours memorizing this form and then doing it and then maybe just maybe if we practice long enough we can understand one percent of it that is a phenomenal waste of time if if you look at the way like most jujitsu classes or run most brazilian jujitsu classes they, they'll have a warm-up and we can we can pick on warm-ups and point out a lot of things that are wrong with warm-ups but they'll usually do some combative movements they'll do some sit out some shrimping across the mat some break falls, some tumbling, whatever. But there are combat applications of that stuff that is immediately taught. Here's what the sit out is for. Oh, that's why we do that move in the warm up. Here's what a break fall is for. Oh, that makes perfect sense now, right? This is taught immediately. And uh, yeah, I, I love how you, you put that out. Wasting your students' time is akin to a crime. Man, and it rhymes if you say it that way. I love it, man. I love it. And, and come with come with that time is a lot of money too. And they're they're putting their money and their trust for you. Like my my, you know, when I train without my instructor, who you know, my moral compass. Thank God, I thank God every day. My moral compass I got from my father, but my my toughness compass I got from my instructor. You know, spent twenty plus years in prison terrible things to people he did um mm. but without him in that time of my life in that area where i grew up you know just the it just he saved my life and i'll mm. always i'll always thank him and thank god we did like so little kata it was like such a small part of anything and so much time instead of techniques he, he his was so much teaching me you know, just how to be, not be a, a bitch, just don't be a mm. bitch. And that's, it was, you know, and then the training came along with it. And it's just, you know, but our students, I'm not going to, my students, you know, uh, I try to show a really good moral compass along with being tough, but our students, our parents look up to us like you, our, my kid's going to get bullied. I want my kid to have confidence. I want my kid to have focus i want my kid you know to have to have all these things uh you know like respect and stuff they come to us for that and we can't let them down by by pretending these choreographed things are going to do anything for them mm -hmm. so you could you could, you could go on that on, you know a, a one technique thing where if you do if you do a kata and there's you know you it's an it's a three minute kata, you might find a second or two of something. And I say coincidental, I think kata, I've been doing Shotokan, you know, I used to watch the, there was a Shotokan, that's how they, 
they're, they're downward block. And that's, mm. you know, so yeah, you might be able to scrape somebody's hand off, but that's mm. the way I saw them doing their downward block. So maybe that's a coincidental thing, maybe. I don't know. Could be. But but to learn, but but to have to memorize, take your memory. You we have such limited space up here. If we have yeah. to memorize all those movements going this direction, that direction, this hand, this hand, here, here, here. We're taking away so much stuff that we're and these parents, they're looking at us with like eat you with it with the with the eyes looking right at our saying, please help me with our kid, help me raise my kid. I need you to teach him how to be confident and to, and protect himself if he ever needs it. And then the adults are coming to me saying, you know, I got a wife and kids. I want to be a stronger guy. I want to be more of a, you know, I want to have more confidence. You know, I want, I might have to defend my family someday. I take that shit seriously. I'm not going to teach him a bunch of bullshit stuff. I'm going to teach him uh. the best techniques I know that will help him to get stronger and faster and learn the right techniques. And thank God I have, I have some bit of credibility. A lot of it is because they've seen what I teach on the big screen. So mm -hmm. that gives me some credibility. I thank God for that. Um, but I'm lucky to get that. But but a lot of people can fool their student base into thinking that's just gonna do anything. When and the worst, the easiest guy to fight in the street isn't isn't a guy that's never trained before. It's a guy that's trained traditional karate before. They're mm. easier to beat than the fighter because the fighter might not know how to punch, but at least he's trying. He's not doing stuff like, you know what I mean. Yeah. So. I've always thought a regular a regular guy that just had been in some street fights could beat a traditional karate guy. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. An untrained, yeah. athletic, aggressive person is a big problem for a traditional yeah. martial artist. They yeah. hate hearing this, but it's absolutely yeah. true. It's a hundred percent true. I mean, I've I've experienced that myself. I've seen it many many times. But again, it's because they they have not experienced that level of aggression before and yeah. it's, getting it's punched not in some... the face can yes. you punch in the face we teach our kids right off the bat you, it's not going to kill you to get punched in the face guys you'll get over it mm. it's not it's not the end of the world especially you guys your kids you don't hit that hard and we don't make them go out there and spar to the death or anything but they do mm. spar and they get whacked in the face here and there and they mm. and guess what when they do they go well it wasn't that bad okay let's go you know so yeah, yeah, it's uh, kid, kids are resilient. No, no, I that saying that shouldn't be confused with let's let's pummel children in the face and give them brain damage. And I that's I don't imagine that's what you're you're advocating at no. all either. No, but, no, we don't. We in fact, is, I do a per, I do a percentage thing where I tell them to use this much, you know, you know, punching in the face, and we spar, we spar, even my fight teams now. We spar, I spar less with my fight teams. I My fight teams spar less than when I first opened my gym in 85. It was, mm. sparring was to the fucking knockout. I mean, mm. it, when Chuck first started training in 90, I mean, we would go, we would swing at each other. Um, but now drilling is king. We drill, we drill a hundred times more than we free spar. And when we mm. free spar, I mean, we, we very seldom, they, the only punch they can throw to the face now, uh, unless, you know, they're a fighter and they have a fight coming up next, next month, is a jab. And the only reason I let them jab to the face is because I don't want them to only defend here. Like gyms that only do body shots, Kyoshi Shin guys, great. Mm. But they kept their hands down so much when that once yep. in a while kick came up, it landed a lot more because they were so used to blocking here because 90% of their strikes were coming here. In ours, there's so much yeah. jabbing coming out. That at least they keep their hands up. So if a head kick comes, their hands are up here. So that's the way I get around the, the constant boom, boom, boom to the head. It's just I, I let them jab to the face. Almost everything else is to the body. Once in a while, we do... We, we do a little more face, especially if a guy has a fight coming up. But you don't have to train to the face. You don't have to mm. spar to the face at all to be a better fighter in the street. You just don't. 
Hmm. It's, it's well, not going to help you at all. People say, well, if you don't teach them to hit hard, what if they get hit hard in the face? They'll never know. I go, really? Well, what about if they don't, if a cop is training, should they real use real bullets? Because how are you gonna how are you gonna be successful in a in a gunfight if you never been shot? Or what about a knife guy? Should they use real blades? Because they might get stabbed? No, that's not the way it works. The same the same holds true for, for uh sparring in my gym. Well, it, it's to... shockingly hard to teach young guys this lesson. Yeah. <laughs> I hate to interject. Normally the show is 30 minutes. We went a little over, but I am going to say we covered a lot of topics. Obviously, yeah. we had a great time. We'll have Ramsey come back on, and we'll cover some more topics. But, <laughs> unfortunately, we've gone well over the time that we normally do. But I did promise the people in the comments, one thing we do in the show is at the end of the show, we, we, we attend to the comments and we start answering. We have a lot of comments, guys. So <laughs> let's see if we can, we can do like a quick fire, quick answer to the comments that came in. Um, for those of you watching, this is going to be cross-platform. So not only is it here on the Pit Online Dojo, uh, Ramsey's going to have a copy of it and do something with it. And then it's also going to be on my channel as well for the Social Jello with Angelo show. Mm -hmm. So that being said, we're going to turn to the comments real quick. And um, and then we'll do our and then we'll do our final wrap-up. Nicholas, are pro fighters. Okay, well, it's before before Nicholas. There's a question. I always like to say hello to everyone. Hello, Zen. Where's Alex Pereira? Yeah. Says Reptiles for Life. He's probably training for a fight. RK, Ramsey is top man. There you go, Ramsey. Got a fan here. And Nicholas, Sweet. are pro fighters' hands not that adapted for bare knuckle fighting in the street? Guys? Yeah, it's a yes <laughs> to no question. Uh, more than the average person that never punches anything. Because of because of Hicks law, every time you punch a bag, you build up you 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 build up your hands, you build you densify your hands more. I do a lot of monkey wire work, so I work my hands specifically, uh, so I know they're they're thicker. I've actually had them tested; uh, they're like three times thicker than the average. Um, but but the average the average fighter wraps his hands, takes care of his hands. He depends on his hands. So he doesn't really give them, you know, the 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 kind of uh, force that they need to develop. So the short answer is no, they don't. But I mean, to be honest, they 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 probably they have tougher hands than the average person, but not as tough as someone that develops their hands, like a kung fu guy probably does in in China, or maybe a karate guy does in Japan. But Americans, we don't we don't develop our hands that much, except I do. But most don't. Ramsey? Right. What do you think, Ramsey? Yeah, it, it's going to depend on the fighter that you're talking about. A lot of pro fighters are walking around with broken hands. Like, I, I know quite a few of them with broken bones in their hands, and they have constant problems. And so, yeah, those guys, probably not. Now, uh, speaking of, um, like, the, the, uh, the Iron Fist or Iron Hand Kung Fu yeah. Masters in China, th there are a few of those guys out there. Yeah. But the the interesting thing about that is they spend all of their time hitting that hand and covering in an ointment and doing demos and yeah. most of them don't know much about fighting. <laughs> and so we, we have this dichotomy. Guys who know how to fight and you know have tougher hands than the average person but might be walking around with a broken bone versus a guy with a rock hard hand who doesn't know how to fight. Which one do you want to be? <laughs> Neither. <laughs> <laughs> MMR 2006. I've heard, I've seen this comment so many times. Ramsey has an amazing voice. He could tell a story. <laughs> <That's>... <laughs> All right. Well, Zed well, Baron, the movie is Enter the Dragon when uh, Ramsey was talking about the movie Saw with Bruce Lee. Uh, Zen also says most of the gun videos are bullshit. Gamma, this is awesome. Thanks, guys. You're welcome. John Cox. Is there a practical application for ninja smoke? I'll give you all 10 seconds to answer this. <laughs> I, don't even, I have no idea what that is. I just, so no. Okay. I, I'm going to say, um, I'm going to plead the fifth. I have no idea. <laughs> Ramsey? Well, uh, here's my question. How many of you regularly and routinely carry around ninja smoke bombs in your pockets just in case you get attacked on the streets? And if you do... What happened to you during your childhood that led you to that point in your life? Because that's weird, man. Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. <laughs> that's probably what happened. 
So, wait, would that be? Do you think that'd be more effective? Because I carry a gun, so should I carry smoke instead? I don't know what, what I should pull out first if I get attacked now. Well, uh, well, technically, smoke comes after the bullet, so you are carrying smoke. <laughs> <laughs> All right, next question. Uh, Gamma, Mr. Hackleman, what do you think about judo throws or maybe Greco style throws if you have to get close? Uh, I, I think, I think, I think judo throws, I think judo throws and Greco throws um, are, are king when it comes to clinching against the cage or sometimes in the middle of the cage. Um, and they've also adapted more wrestling too. But I think, uh, then I think in the in the in the center of the in the ring or the or on the mat, I think the the just straight up uh, uh, freestyle wrestling I think is king when it's in the middle and you have to shift directions. But I think uh, I think in the street, I think it depends on what you're better at because if you're trying to lower your level into into a street situation and you're not a freaking you know really really good wrestler really good wrestler um you're gonna you're gonna find yourself in a guillotine and getting choked to death or you know even elbow to the head and that in that case a lot of times the upper body clinch would be better like a you know just like an old school hoist gracie clinch or a, or a judo throw from a clinch with a trip but again you have to be you have to be you have to be pretty skilled to do those things I think every here's my that was a long answer. I think every I think every I think jujitsu um, lacks throws, lacks takedowns, and I think I think they'll never win a fight against a striker until they learn wrestling takedowns, whether that wrestling be uh, freestyle or Greco, and I think they need to new, new, uh, learn some jujitsu throws too. So. I think I think I think the answer is whatever you're best at, because nobody told uh, um, nobody told Ronda Rousey, hey, this this ju judo stuff doesn't work, or no, see Kayla, what's her name, Kayla now, holy Kayla shit, Harrison, yeah. nobody is telling her, hey, guess what, your judo stuff's not working, yeah, judo, people have been saying that for right, Gre your Greco wrestling that doesn't work, yeah, tell that to Randy Couture, yeah. There, Greco works, judo works, sambo works, um, you know, freestyle wrestling works, catch rush wrestling works. Anytime you get your hands on someone, if you learn the proper way to take them down, it works. If they hit the ground, then it worked. So there's there is not really that's better or worse. And I think I think MMA has proven that. That's why I love MMA so much. That's why I call it Sensei UFC because they're the proving grounds so you don't have to go to the street to learn their shit, right? What do you think? Sure, yeah, your strongest skill set is going to work the best. So if you don't understand judo, you don't understand how to shift somebody's weight onto the other leg and unbalance them, and you don't have the ability to hip toss them, judo isn't going to work out so well for you. If you have a stronger skill set in freestyle wrestling, that's obviously going to work better than judo. Um, but I, I get this question a lot from from guys who haven't trained at all and they want to know where to start. Like, is judo a good place to start? Is freestyle wrestling a good place to start? Should I take a BJJ class first if I want to be an MMA fighter or defend myself on the street? It's always the street, never the sidewalk, uh, never a lawn. But I think I think that's where most people asking this question are coming from is where should I start? And mm -hmm. I I am not really sure how to address that question. I, I, I know guys like, for example, uh, guys who who were former members of the Chinese national judo team who went in M MMA and had phenomenal success with their judo throws like Lu Kai, Zhang Xiang and so on. And these guys make their judo work and they look spectacular doing it and they do some some crazy throws that most people would never dream of doing in the cage and most people simply can't do because they don't have that skill set but they didn't start there so i you could do a lot worse as, as a starting point 
than a judo class. It'll it'll teach you a lot of very important things. But again, more important than the label on the gym, like if it says judo or karate or jujitsu or whatever, is what's actually being taught at that gym. So go try it out first. Good. All right. So next comment. And we're, we're almost we're almost there, guys, by the way. <laughs> uh, atomic bomb nuclear war. That's, that's a long name, bro. Close by threats exist a lot. So Dewey's wrong on that. <laughs> Wait, what, what is? What did he say? What now? <laughs> Close by threats exist a lot. So Dewey's wrong on that. And he's talking about the, of the conversation when we had the gun to the head or the gun mm. really close. And I wonder what neighborhood he's from. He must be from the hood. He must be <laughs> from the hood when they do that. Or maybe he's doing it to himself. You know, I have to defend yourself. What if you want to, like, life's going that bad, you, you got to defend yourself now. Mm. Wow. That was a, that was a counseling for you. Right? Counseling. Sounds like counseling. Sounds like counseling. I'm not answering that counseling. question. <laughs> Ramsey? He's a, he, well, he's as, a, as I mentioned in, in this podcast, I do have a friend who got shot in the head at point blank range. So obviously, as I pointed out, as I did say, this stuff does exist. It is, however, in my experience, the exception and not the norm. Big, big exception. All right. So Zen. Yep. I was one of them. OK. Atomic bomb nuclear war says they do that for use of intimidation and control. John Cox. Is walking around with a COVID mask and effective deterrence. See, now, now John Cox is just trying to get Hackleman on a rant. So, <laughs> what do you say? What do you say? He's he wearing the mask still? He's walking, he's he's walking around with a mask and effective deterrent. I think, you know why they wear the mask? Because they don't want anyone to know who they are. It's not a defect, effective deterrent. What it is, is like you, if you have, you're hiding. You're, get off the mask, guys. Let's, 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 let's say hi to everyone now. God, you look so creepy now. Jeez, there's still people like that. Ramsey, do you want to? Do you have anything to add on on that? If you guys are in Asia, don't oh, answer man. it. You guys are both in Asia. They, they, they were wearing masks before. I'm, I told you this. I'm we had a lot of I, I was yeah, there. Asians Some were wearing love masks. That. They love masks before COVID. I say, uh... <laughs> I say that. I speak, my wife. My wife goes nuts. I go. That's the Asian person. I was in Japan in like 1980. They were all wearing masks then. Yeah, so they they like to wear masks for whatever reason. I think it's respect, and yeah. I, I appreciate that. Here it's not respect. Here it's making a statement of their political party. That's all it is here. But in mm. Asia, it's not like that. It's it's a sign of respect. I wish it was like that here, but it's not. All right. Mm. It's also uh, women covering up their faces because they don't want uh, sun damage. Oh, yeah, no, that... that's a very common thing in China. <sighs> Yeah, no, yeah. in Japan too, they'll wear it, it freaked me out. I was <laughs> driving in my Do they car, wear the face got, kini? So just full on. And I was like, is it like a what? And she was like wearing a hat and like the mask, and then like these sleeves to cover because she didn't uh, want any uh, part uh, of her skin getting any sun. Uh, yeah, I, I, I'm they're, they're way into skincare here, man. <laughs> yes, yeah, so like, yeah, now you're getting me on a rant, John Cox. Thank you, guitar rock forever. Totally unexpected crossover. Ramsey and the pitmaster in the same room. Zen Baron. When I was a McDo when I was at a McDojo, my instructor kept procrastinating that we're gonna hit heavy bag and we never did. Sorry, man. We need a McDojo topic. We'll do that one day. Zen, right. Uh Jesse A. I'd love to get rid of many, I'd love to get rid of many of the forms and my katas, but my grandmaster is not on board. I agree that time should be learning combos and getting confident. Zen Baron, I watch Power Rangers and have my own martial arts show now. A martial <laughs> a joke. All right, Kevin, I like it. And finally, okay, and this is our last question, guys. Weights or calisthenics, the martial arts for martial arts strength training or both? Let me reiterate that. Weights or calisthenics for martial arts training, strength training, or both. And I'm going to hand this over to you, John. Yeah, both. that's like that's so that's that's. Uh... It has to be both. You just have to. <laughs> there's no, there's no, there's no way around that one. I don't know about you. I never did wrong. one push up in my life. I just went straight to bench press. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That, that's like asking, should I strike or should I grapple in an MMA fight? I mean, yes, yes, okay. you should. Yeah, uh, I get, I get that all the time. But 
Well, that was great, man. That was great. All right. What do you think? That's Pretty cool. good, Angelo. Good job. That was a good six man. You're getting uh putting you like uh putting us together was good because I, I would never have uh you know I'm not I'm not like you're I'm not the YouTube thing like you guys as much, but but I, you know, but you guys you do a great job with that putting us together because I think it was a great uh I think it was a great uh, exchange of uh of ideas, you know, and, and yeah, for and, sure. Yeah, so <laughs> I appreciate it, man. I appreciate it. But I appreciate you yeah, guys likewise. trying to do it. And we're going to do it again. Again, like I said, I'll, I'll set this up again. We'll do a different topic. We'll try and narrow it down. So for those of you who stuck along for the for the, for the the whole hour and a half, I know we know our show is 30 minutes, but we appreciate you taking the time to check it out. And uh, when we do this again, uh, I'll try to mitigate the time a little better next time. So again, Ramsey, thanks for coming out. Well, that's it. Thanks again for checking out Social Jello with Angelo podcast. One of these once a week. Make sure to subscribe and share with your friends. Catch you all next time.